uh, series, and I totally forgot. I thought I never preached a series. This was three sermons in a series I preached um, four years ago. <clears throat> and uh, today I'm preaching the, the last of the, the last of those three sermons. And as just by way of review, if you remember the name Nadab and Abihu, those were two of the sons of Aaron. And they had a flippant attitude about worship. They were given very specific things that they were to do, permitted to do to, to in worship. And they authorized, they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord in their incense. And fire came out from the from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And that was uh, that was the beginning of the series of, about worship. And Nadab and Abihu were the two older sons of Aaron. And along with Aaron and their two younger brothers, they were anointed and ordained to be priests of God, but they did something that pleased God, and they were destroyed. And it said in, in verse 3 of, this was in um, Leviticus chapter 10, and it said in verse 3, Among those who approach me, I will be honored. So apparently what Nadab and Abihu were doing dishonored God. This took place in the holy place, inside of the tent of meeting, behind the curtain that separated the presence of God from the people. Inside here was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, the atonement cover. And here was the altar, the golden altar of incense. Besides the incense, the blood of the annual atonement was offered on that altar. And that's where they had this flippant attitude and used the unauthorized or profane fire and they were destroyed. I'm going to save this joke for later because I'm on the serious part here. So, why do we worship? God commands the worship. And in Revelation chapter 19, the first 10 verses, there are four hallelujahs. Verse 1, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. In verse 3, again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then in verse 6 it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our, for our Lord, God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8, fine linen, bright and clean, he has given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, 
These are the words of God. Verse 10, at his feet. At, at this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 8, it says, I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and <coughs> with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. John was corrected by the angel and told to worship God. Worship is due to God. Yes. He deserves it. Yes. In other words, he is worthy. Yes. The first hallelujah sounded like a great multitude in heaven. It was a roar, a very loud noise. Second, in verse 3, was the same multitude. Again, they shouted, and again they roared. Not a whisper, not a quiet worship. And then in verse, three, then in verse uh, 4, the third hallelujah, 24 elders and the four living creatures, they fell down and worshipped God. The great multitude Again, the nature of their worship, shouting, shouting. They cried, more shouting and falling down. Shouting, crying out, falling down. This is pure excitement. We should be excited because our God wins. We should be excited because our God heals. Yes, we should be excited because our God saves. We should be excited because our God loves us. Yes, we should be excited because our God has a place for us in eternity. We should be excited because our voices will be part of the sound of the great multitude. The roar will be roaring right along with them. Roaring loud. No whispers. We should be excited because we'll be falling down around the throne of God. And it won't hurt. There's no hurts in heaven. <laughs> We should be excited because there will be shouting, hallelujah. Yes. Shouting, not whispering. Shouting in a loud voice. We should be excited because we will be in his presence. Crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. John was caught up in all of this powerful worship. Why he worshipped the angel, I don't know. He was so excited, he didn't know what he was doing. The angel rebuked him, worship only God. It's worthwhile to note that the angel was a fellow servant. And we are fellow servants with John. The angel said, I'm a fellow servant. Don't worship me. And that applies to us. We're fellow servants with the angels. John's worship was misplaced. The angel said, don't do that. Worship God. John fell down. Fell down at the feet of the angel. It was only the 24 elders and the four creatures that were at the throne at this point. The rest of the multitude was heard by John, but it doesn't say that he saw them. What he heard was a powerful sound, 
a roaring sound. It was powerful actions and sound. He was not included. He was a witness. He was not one of the 24 elders. He was not one of the living creatures. He was only an observer at this point. He was in heaven, but he wasn't dead. He couldn't stay there. He just has to, had to go back and write what he saw as a permanent testimony forever in the word. He was so overwhelmed with emotion that he had to fall in worship, even though it was at the feet of the angel. He just had to fall down. He was overwhelmed. It seems that there is an innate need in the heart of man to worship. Worship someone or something. We come to anything that is powerful or unexplained with an awe. Wow, that's awesome. That's powerful. Far out, they used to say back in the hippie days. Remember the parking lot banner? Did you ever see this? Not banner, barrier. This was about, I don't know, I lose track of time. Maybe 20 years ago, 25. In a city somewhere in the United States where there was a, a, a population of, of Hindu people which is, that could be anywhere. And this city worker was assigned to remove a parking barrier from where it was and just to take it somewhere. So he set it up, they showed this on television, he set it up with a machine at the corner of a parking lot. And it was about this high and about this size and the top of it was sort of um, like a bullet shape. And the Hindu people thought it came up out of the ground and it was a deity and they started worshiping it. It was a piece of cement. They were pouring milk over it. They were putting flowers in front of it. They were worshiping a parking lot barrier that some guy put over there with a machine. We worship our favorite football team with shouting. The fan roars when they win. God has always declared himself to be a jealous God. We're not to wrap our hearts around anyone or anything else in worship. God will not tolerate idolatry. Did you ever see a rosary bead? Did you ever see one of those? I have one of those. I was going to bring it and I forgot. I have one of those left over from when we were, when we were Catholic. And there's all these little beads there. A, there's ten of them. And then there's a space and another bead and ten more and a space and another bead. And those ten beads are all Hail Mary prayers. And then the one bead is a Lord's Prayer. And they go around that thing and pray. Almost all of it is to Mary. That's idolatry. It's the worshiping of a wonderful person, but she's a dead woman. No one else is worthy of our worship except God himself. Not angelic beings, not saints, not Mary, not your family, not your home, not your hobbies. No one but God. Worship has nothing to do with where we are. Nothing to do with who we're with. Nothing to do with what day it is. Worship cannot be compartmentalized. You can't say, I'm going to worship when I go to church with God's people. It has nothing to do with where you are, who you're with. Worship cannot be contained. If your heart wrapped around God, you're going to have a worshipful attitude with Him all the time. There isn't a time and a place. We can, we should worship God anytime and anywhere God wants us to. 
so we come together on the Lord's Day for corporate worship, which is a powerful thing when we join our hearts together in worship. That's a corporate worship. But that doesn't mean we can say that's the only time we're going to worship. God wants us to keep the Lord's person holy. We keep the Lord's day holy, but we keep the Lord's person holy. Who's the Lord's person? You are. <laughs> Second Corinthians six seventeen to eighteen. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So once you have come out and come to Him in repentance, you are the Lord's person, one of many. We belong to Him for one of His sons and daughters. Those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior are to be separated from the world and separated unto God. That doesn't mean you can't touch anything. That just means that your heart isn't fastened on the world and its problems, its promises, etc., etc., but your heart is fastened on God. The life of the believer is to be kept holy, separated unto God. We're no longer common, no longer of the world. We have to struggle to keep this in mind, that we belong to God. Our purpose in life is to worship Him. That's why we exist. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. The world is hostile to God and hostile to God's people. And when we start to wrap our hearts around the things of the world, our possessions and all sorts of things, we lose our separation unto God. We lose our holiness. And the Bible says without holiness, no one will see God. John was apparently so awed by what he's experiencing that he just had to fall down and worship. He didn't know what he was doing. He was just overwhelmed. Old Testament worship was very scripted. It involved singing, it involved sacrifice, drink offerings, grain offerings, animal sacrifice, incense, vestments, rules and regulations. It was all structured. So we do see emotional worship in David who danced before the Lord with all his might. That was outside of the structure of the temple. His heart was stirred by what he was doing for God. He was moving the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. His heart was stirred. He didn't care what anybody thought about how he looked. He wasn't concerned about dignity before God. We don't have any dignity. There isn't any. He knows what's inside of you and outside of you, and he knows what you're doing. We don't have any dignity before God that you need to have a dignified kind of worship. <coughs> Years ago, and this is probably, oh man, probably 50 years ago, I was on a, I was on a 700 Club Counselor panel in Hartford, Connecticut. Channel 18, Hartford, Connecticut, had their own version of the 700 Club. And people would call and for prayer, and you talk to them and try to uh, lead them to the Lord. And many of them we did. And um, so this one lady called my letter to the Lord, and then I said, now you, you know, you need to get plugged into a Bible believing church. And I was suggesting the Assembly of God Church, which was my church at the time there. And she said, Assembly of God, that's holy rollers. She said, I like a little dignity, dignity with my religion. We don't have any. We don't have any dignity. So we must come to worship in humility. 
Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5 verses. In the year that, uh, that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, lifted up in the King James, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see how that thought of yours connected with my sermon today? Isn't that, isn't that God? Doesn't he do that? At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with, with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, King James. I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. We are undone before God. <laughs> We can't hide anything from him. We're undone. We are ruined if we try to keep something away from God. We have no, there's no dignity. Psalm 103, verse 6 verses, Praise the Lord, my soul, all his inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Anyone who's in sin is oppressed until you get free from it. And who's in sin? Everybody that ever walked on the planet except for Jesus himself. First verse says, My soul, that's my inmost being, and the King James, all that is within me, and it says his holy name. Verse 2, forget not, my soul, remember all that he does, all his benefits. Verse 4, redeem, redeems your life. Worship him because of the cost of our salvation. Isaiah 53 is a really good picture which was a prophecy. You guys all know Isaiah 53. I don't need to read the whole thing, do I? You know, you know Isaiah 53. I could read just a couple of snippets from it. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our sin was on Jesus on the cross. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord, and though the Lord makes uh, his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It just describes the suffering Savior. The cost of our salvation... This is, why, this is why we worship him. Luke chapter 22, 41. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood 
falling to the ground. I'm convinced that what the cup was, that he would become sin, our sin would be put on him, and the Father would turn away from him. He had never been separated from the Father. But my sin caused that anguish. I don't think he was afraid of being tortured and, and, and killed. I don't think so, because that's why he came here. But, but the thought of being separated from the Father and becoming sin, I think that was so odious to him that that's why he cried out in an anguish. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The cost of our salvation, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He, that's the only way we can become God's righteousness, is in him. You can't, you can't get there through Mohammed or Ramakrishna or anything else. You, he's, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. He earned our worship yes. by going through all that. That was the most horrible thing that was going to happen to him was becoming and taking upon himself all the sins of mankind so that we can be reconciled to God. He had never been separated from the Father. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, the Masabak Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, God turned away from him because God cannot look upon sin. And he became the sin. Mine. Take it personal. We have every reason <laughs> to worship God. Forget not all his benefits. Private worship strengthens our bond with God. Corporate worship is powerful. Things happen when God's people come together to worship Him. So what should our worship look like? Should we roar? <laughs> Maybe we'll roar when we get to heaven. What should it look like? Are you excited? Forget not all His benefits. He has touched you. He has touched you himself and set you free from the law of sin and death. What should our worship look like? Are you excited because of that? Has not God blessed you? Then you should be willing to worship. And not just a whisper to worship. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? It's eleven fifty-six. The Baptists are probably already at the restaurant. <laughs> God is good. He is so awesomely good. Then how can we not worship Him? Amen. Worship Him. So let's just do that for a couple minutes. Then I'll turn you loose. All right? Just lift your voices to God and just worship Him. Just thank Him and praise Him.